Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to some of you and peace out to the rest of you. You know who this is, what I'm going to ask you to press, and why I will ask you to press it. It's the blackest man on YouTube. It's the only man so black, you click on the video and your whole screen goes dark. All right, anyway, all jokes aside, um, Jay Shine Random uh, addressed this whole DJ Kid Jason Pope situation. He said he was going to do it, and he kept his word. He said it. I would advise black women to listen to Jay Sean Pope. I mean, to, I'm sorry, Jay Sean Random regarding Jason Pope and regarding many things for a particular reason. Jay Sean Random, like me, has a daughter. I've got more than a daughter. I've got daughters with an S. I also got a son. Jay Shine Random is a father. He behaves as a father is supposed to behave. He is not um, negligent. And um, I don't get to live with my, my kids now. I can't find as lucrative a job in the U.S. I never will be able to as far as I know. It's no use even looking. And I got to build my family's future abroad. Not everybody feels they have to, maybe not everybody even has to. I'm aware that I have to. I'm, I have to do it and I'm aware of it. I don't have an option. I never did. So that being said, um, sisters, you should listen to him. Now brothers, I'm not gonna sit up here and tell you that if you part of the passport gang, you should turn in your passport to stop using it. I ain't gonna say that. What I am gonna say though, brothers, is this. It's more important for sisters to listen right now than it is for us, because even the comments underneath his video regarding Jason Pope show that a lot of brothers don't know what SYSBM is about. Now, there are SYSBM that go into South Asia, Southeast Asia or Eastern Asia. <laughs> ain't no black women out there. It's not an option for them. Most of them actually are in somewhere, there's, there's somewhere in the Americas, um, and so it's black women for them. It's just not American black women. What they're differing on mainly is what they're looking for, and that's the same thing as what you find in the general society. You find men that are looking for committed marriages. You find men that are looking for committed relationships, but not necessarily marriage. You find men that are looking for no commitment. You pay to play, pay, pay as you go along. So just have a little fun. I don't disrespect you, I'm polite to you, you polite to me, but we screwing. At the end of the day, we mostly screwing. I'm here on vacation, I'm not gonna live here. You ain't gotta put up with me forever and I ain't gotta put up with you forever. You find a lot of that. Sabona. So that being said, uh, these guys that are, um, these guys are not all what uh, the stereotype to be by the, rest of the, by the rest of our population. So since things are different, Things uh, do change from, from one to the other. However, what they do agree on is they ain't going to give the scrag a daggle, the American Sapphire or Becky or the Western Sapphire or Becky a chance anymore. They done. She's, she's played out. Collectively speaking, she played herself out. So these guys are agreed upon that. Now, contrary to what people think, a lot of CISPIM actually do uh, talk about starting businesses. What kind of businesses you should and should not start when you're abroad. Now, the only thing that is not really being talked about yet is the laws in these different areas. And that has more to do with um, the fact that these, uh, that's still being researched. There are CISBIM that are looking into different business laws for foreigners in different countries. Jay Shine is right about one thing. You are a foreigner. And until the day you get that passport, you are a foreigner. So if they got different laws for foreigners, these laws apply to you, and the nation has no interest in allowing foreigners freedoms that they don't allow citizens. Jay Shine is right about that. You are in somebody else's jurisdiction, not because you're a black man, but because you're not from that particular region. That's why. It's the same. Legally speaking, it's the same for whites. White privilege is largely a psychological thing. It's, everywhere you go, it's actually more psychological and financial than it is legal. That's the truth of the matter. Now... Jay Shine's right about that. So I would say, brothers, when he says you can't run from this white man, I would say, well, it's true. You can't run from him forever. I mean, you can't retreat and escape him. You could strategically retreat and go certain areas like what I'm attempting to do. 
strategically retreat, go to an area where these folks don't tolerate as much from crackers as other people. And then, you know, they, I can sit up here and tell them what this crackers like. And what happens is that when, that when the crackers that do come over here, especially the ones from the United States and the white ones from South Africa, especially when they come over here, they wind up proving what I'm telling these Arabs about the cracker. Then what I've done is I've, I've set up a system where I've set up a situation wherein people realize, OK, you know what? The black man ain't our enemy and it, you can't convince us that he is. The one we've been looking up to and wanting to be like and whose women we've been wanting to marry is more the enemy. And here's the thing. That, and, here, and here's where that plays in. He shows himself to be an enemy. But if we would stop calling black folks slaves, we'd have a better relationship with him. I tell them, I say to them, look, you're not going to go to the U.S. and study because Gulf Arabs don't. I mean, you're not going to go there and live and stay because Gulf Arabs don't do that. Gulf Arabs study in the U.S. And then they leave and go back to their homes. You're not going to go to the U.S. and stay. I understand that. But understand that when you do go to the U.S., you're going to deal with some of the reaction from black Americans because some of your non-Gulf fellow Arabs went over there and called us slaves. And we heard it and we know what it means. We were the ones becoming Muslim when nobody else would even look sideways at it, especially white folks. That was us. And so what's going on now at this point is that you're going, there's going to be a reaction. You're going to deal with the fallout because we don't like it when you call us slaves, especially when you call us slaves and you don't have a goddamn thing to say about that white man and you let him off the hook. We're going to tell you, we're going to say to you what the F is wrong with you. That's who we are. We're going to say to you, so, um, so you just going to let this white dude slide with what he did, but you're going to take us to task for it. We know about this. We know how you'll pay an extra dowry when a woman is light skinned, very, very pale. We understand how you'll you'll up the dowry and we tired of that mess. Don't come to that. What don't come to us with that stuff. Get that out of our face. And. And and it's working to a certain extent It's very slow, but to a certain extent, it actually is working. The people are looking and they're saying, whoa, 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 we can't be sitting up here listening to the European. Because when they complain about the changes going on in their country and how it's become less conservative, I always say to them, did black Americans ask you to do this? Did Africans ask you to do this? Well, did Europeans ask you to do it? Did Americans ask you? And the answer is simple. When I mention the black folks, the answer is no. We didn't ask them to become this way. When I ask them about the white folks, the answer is yes. They ask us to become this way. I ask them, is there, are there any black people putting pressure on you to, to, to throw aside your religion and where it meets the law? No. The answer is never yes. It's not black folks doing it. And they come to understand, we're not their enemy, the cracker is. But we're gonna become their enemy if they don't shape up quick enough, which is what their religion demands that they do. And if they don't, and they become the enemy, that's it, they're no longer Muslims anyway, because they sided with the oppressor against the oppressed. And then that means that we now become their replacement. And it doesn't bother me either way, either they get on our side as an ally, or God takes, snatches their faith away, in which case they would definitely be ruined anyway. They'd have no honor and they would have no strength and it wouldn't matter if they were our enemies. They'd just be more heads to cut off. That's what it boils down to. Either you side with us against this white man. End of story. Or we got to take your butts out right along with them and you'll be a good warm up practice because y'all ain't much to, uh, you really ain't much to roll over. You'll be good practice on them crackers. That's what it comes down to. So if, in fact, we can't run from them forever, then Jay Shine is on to something. Like I said last time. But Jay Shine, if you are on to a way that we can fight these crackers back, you cannot put that on YouTube. You're gonna to have to start telling some people word of mouth. You're gonna to have to let them know. Or you're gonna to have to find another name or some other platform that can't be traced to you by which to put this out there. At some point down the line, it's going to have to come out, but not digitally, or not digitally traceable. Because not only black folks, but everybody's going to need to know how to fight this cracker. He is the devil in human form at the end of the day, not because he's white, but because of this system that they set up. Now, that being said, let's get to Jason Pope and what this got to do with us black men. It's easy to think that we're the most broken men in the world as African-Americans because we're in the United States and we see all these other non-white men come in and they have this stuff together. Let me explain this to you. Their people don't have this stuff together. It's just that the U.S. lets in those who seem to have this, have this stuff together, especially financially. 
You don't come to the U.S. with a visa and you're a nobody back in your home country. The average Chinese person will not get a visa to go to the United States. The average South Korean may or may not. It's about 50-50. The average Latin American definitely will not. The average African definitely will not get a visa. The average uh, Pacific Islander will not get a visa. The average person in a non-white, non-wealthy country will not get a visa to go to the U.S. They come with something. Maybe not much, but something. So they're not, they're not coming from the slums of their own countries. The average Indian will not get one. But what do we see when we see the Indians that are in the United States? Now do you understand what I'm getting at? You were talking about how they have a whole culture in Thailand and in the Dominican Republic where they'd even tell their wives, look, I'm not the one that's cleaning up the, uh, the, the furniture. I'm the husband, but you go over there with that gringo and you lay down with him and you get that money. Or they'll tell their, their, their daughters in Thailand, well, we ain't making no money on this farm. You're going to have to go into the city and sell that pussy. They're telling us, I know that that exists. That's the whole point. That exists there. Now, in our society, you don't have a culture where the men are doing this. You don't even have a culture where the women are doing it. There are mothers that are telling their daughters this, but when the mothers tell their daughters and somebody else finds out, the other people are outraged that the mother would tell their daughter this. They're outraged at that. I told her to get out there and sell that pussy because we need the money. You told her to do what? Oh, hell no. See? Over there, everybody understands that you don't have a choice. You, you beat down. You just ain't got no choice. And again, who turned the economy into something like that? The white man, the cracker. So what I'm saying is this. One, we're not worse than other men. But I also agree that that's not an excuse. What I'm saying is that we're actually less broken than other men and women in other parts of the world who went through more than what we went through. I mean, who went through less than what we went through. Considering that we have actually done very well as men and as women. However, however, we men are not to blame for what these women did with DJ Kid because we didn't know about it. For one, that's the first thing. We just didn't even have any clue. Secondly, if we had known about it while it was going on, what you think sisters are going to say? Jay Sean, women cannot have it both ways. We men can't have it both ways. We can barely have it one way. So I have to say the women can't have it both ways. And I'm saying this as a father of more than one daughter. If they are not submissive, we're not responsible for protecting them. I am responsible to protect my daughters. I am responsible to protect my son. I'm responsible to defend my mother if, in the event that my dad needs help. That is true. But I'm also responsible to defend my dad and my brother. But I'm responsible to defend my wife. But I'm not responsible to defend women that I don't know, don't know we're in distress, and wouldn't really welcome my help if I even gave it to them. The minute I have to start working out a strategy with them to tell them this is how we're going to actually succeed in me repelling this enemy and I need you to play this part so that you don't have to fight them. They're going to start wagging their fingers and rolling their eyes and rolling their neck and telling me just be a real nigga and get out there and kick his ass. That's, that's all they want to hear. He over here doing this, doing that. Yeah, but when I say, okay, now, I'm going to go and shoot this nigga. I need you to work out an alibi for me to prove that I wasn't there with, at the time he got shot. Here you go with all that stuff. Ain't nobody going to catch you, nigga. You just scared. That's what we're dealing with. When you're dealing with a woman like that, you are not responsible for her defense. These hood rats that were sleeping with DJ Kid would sleep with a lot of brothers, too. That is true. But there are a lot of brothers they still would not want. And the fact that they've got differing standards for brothers, even though these are hood rats with low standards that I probably could have gotten a club easily. Fact is that they have differing standards for the white dude than they have for the black man. You were absolutely right about one thing, though, and that is that black men let this guy come up here. But see, again, then again, black men didn't know how he felt about us and black men didn't know what he was doing. So we were not responsible. We were responsible because we trusted his ass. That's the wrong thing. That is true. We did have a bad judgment in trusting him. And even then, that's because we're not. But then again, you have to remember, we're not the racist. They are. Now, it is true this. I, and I'm, I'm going to hold my own people accountable for this one. I mean, my own personal friends. Those who hear my voice and say, oh, man. Yeah, I know Blackheart. Yeah, from this neighborhood. I grew up with him. Even if you know me, I'm holding you accountable for this. You remember them cool ass white boys that hung out with us? And I'm not talking about the ones whose initials were MF. I mean, literally, we had one homeboy whose initials were MF. And it wasn't the cuss word. That's not it. But 
I'm not talking about that, because he actually was cool and he was fair with everybody. But you remember the mother so-called cool-ass white boys that could, uh, you know, just do a little vanilla ice routine, recite a few rap lyrics, like Jay Shine said, come in with that yo-yo-yo stuff, wearing a uniform and we let him in. Yeah, that's a cool-ass white dude right there, because they roll around the block, what they call drop down, bumping bass, because they could afford to do it because their parents was white. Yeah, but that, that nigga called Stay Fresh. Well, I mean, he ain't got to do, it's not as hard for, for him, for, uh, it's not as difficult for him. Y'all remember that? You remember how you let them get away with shit you didn't let me get away with? You think I'm going to forgive you niggas for that after puberty? Forget elementary school. Even forget the first year of middle school, just to be fair. That's before puberty. How about after puberty? You think I'm going to let you niggas uh, uh, slide with that? Hell no. I'm preaching liberation. You niggas wanted to talk down that shit. Interrupt, cut me off, uh, uh, blame me like I was insane or something. These guys recite, little, they do that vanilla ice routine, and y'all let them all the F the way in. That nigga black, bruh. No, he not. He ain't gotta be. He's cool, he's fair, or he's not. He's just nice to everybody, and he ain't trying too hard, or he's a damn clown trying too goddamn hard. You niggas let him in anyway. I preach liberation. I simply preach liberation. Oh, he trying too hard to be black. Mm -mm. No, I'm not letting you niggas slide with that shit either. And I'm going to be honest. If I find out about any attractive black woman or unattractive black woman from my neighborhood that screwed one of these down-ass white boys, I wouldn't even blame the white boy. I'd go to the system and be like, what, what's happening with that? What's up with this hypocrisy? You, I mean, I don't have to be your type. That's okay. But if I'm not your type because of my phenotype, then how the F is this full-fledged 100% Caucasian white boy your type? That's a valid uh, point to bring up. I mean, sisters bring it up. I know it sounds weak when a man sit, talks this way, but I'm making a point that if it's wrong for men to talk this way, it's wrong for women to talk this way. So if a woman can say, well, what about my wide nose and big lips and my nappy ass hair? That's not good enough for you. That's not woman enough for you. If they can talk that way, I can say, well, hold the F up. If I'm actually never chasing behind white women ever, then why the hell? Matter of fact, you know what? When I married my non, my, when I married my non Ados wife, I didn't know what a hair texture was. I just assumed, actually, that a hair texture was the same as every other's. It wasn't until we had signed the marriage contract that I found out what a hair texture is actually like. I'm not allowed to tell it, tell you all what it is, but the point I'm making is that I, I simply didn't know what to expect. And I'm saying this to 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 bring a to to bring up the point that many black men are not when they're adults at least and they're out of the control of their mothers they're not colorist anymore. This is something that young black girls and boys learn when they are kids. And so, if the fathers are not in the communities and in the kids' lives like they are, then how who else are we going to blame for passing on uh, this type of colorism to them? We can't have both ways. The men ain't in a community. The men are perpetuating colorism. Which one is it? Who's teaching this to the kids? While we're at it, let's check out the whole culture that we know our children are going to follow when they get into uh, pretty, pretty much when they're going through their childhoods. You know, the teenage, ignorant-ass nigger culture, wherein a lot of them fall through the cracks and wind up in the juvenile justice system and then later on the adult justice system with records that enable the cops to harass them after this point. What, who passes that culture on? I mean, if the men aren't in, if they're not in the community and they're not in the homes, then who the hell is passing this on to the kids? That's another question to, to answer. But the thing is, we can't take the blame for this one. It's like I said in the last thing that I recorded before I put this one up. It is time for black men to actually do one real nigga thing, and that is refuse to take responsibility when you did not have control in the first place. If you were not, if, if you weren't treated like you had the authority, you don't have the responsibility. End of story. If we're not allowed to slap the shit out of our women for doing ignorant stuff like laying down with this ignorant cross-eyed ass cracker, then we're not responsible. Now these Arab men, in the United States at least, they can't slap their women either. But by the same token, if they do slap their woman because she does something wrong and then she turns and calls the cops, the community is going to go after her and the family. They're going to tell the family, you need to pressure her to withdraw this complaint. And they're going to go to her and they're going to say, you withdraw this complaint. Yeah, we slapped you because you were wrong. If you called them on us because we slapped you because you were wrong, you just doubly wrong and then we'll kill you and we'll ostr ostracize your family. That's more than likely what would happen. 
or the family would have to ostracize her in order for the family to stay in the community. What's not going to happen is that she just gets to use that system to escape the bonds of the culture completely overnight. Now, the culture is going to it's going to deteriorate and dilute over generations. That's already happening, because like I said, they will compromise that culture for white folk in a minute. I mentioned that before. But what's not going to happen is that overnight, because one of the women gets mad that she don't get to sleep with whoever she wants to sleep with. She's going to sit up here and use the culture and get away with it all. It's not going to happen. It ain't going to happen. Now, as far as him being killed for fornication, no, not really. Much as we think it is, a lot of Arabs don't really do that, especially not in Western countries. I mean, they don't do that even in every Arab country. But what they will do is there's going to be a repercussion. You ain't just going to go out here and take every dingling you want, especially from outside men. And then nothing happened to you. So it's not as extreme as what we imagine. The Afghan men, a lot of times when they're fighting, yeah, yeah they, they, they don't necessarily look down on their women per se. But what does happen is that they will defend their women because their women will, will listen to them as long as they're doing their part. That's why they'll do it. If their women stop listening to them, they will also say, if we ain't defending the women, we're here to protect the kids. That's it. And if the women get enough political power to where the kids don't have to listen to the men, the men will say, we're no longer fighting. Do what the hell you want. We're going to go to your countries without our wives and our children, and we're going to take everything, every resource, every wealth that we want out of your country at that point. We don't have... We no longer have women to fight for or kids to fight for. That's what they would do. Other men in the same situation will do the same goddamn thing. End of story. In Egypt, they're going through something like this. And these men are saying, we ain't fighting for these women and we're not protecting them. No longer. No more. That's what they're saying. In Tunisia, they were about to change the law to where non-Muslim women, I'm not saying Tunisian, I'm simply saying non, I'm sorry, they were going to change the law to where Muslim women could marry non-Muslim men, which is against the Sharia. And the men said, uh, if you do that mess, then we're not going to marry the Muslim women. They're going to marry these non-Muslim men because they got more money because they come from Europe. We're going to go north into Europe and we're going to marry the white bitch. None of us will marry any of you anymore. And any of you that ever did marry one of them and it doesn't work out can't come back and marry one of us as a second husband. You can't divorce them and then come to us. We ain't going to take you no more if you did that. They knew. And eventually they went ahead. From what I heard, they repealed it. But the main thing was that the women got up and said, no, actually, forget about that. You're not going to pass this law just because a few women don't want to hold on to their religion and they want to sell their bodies in exchange for it. Or they want to give up their religion so that they can uh, marry a man with more money. You're not going to do that. You're not changing this rule. You're not going to change God's rule for some Europeans. I was shocked when I heard that they stood up like that. So it was actually the women that did this. Now, if you look at us and how we are actually more broken and we have less power over the women and we really haven't had any since we got here, to the, since we got there to the place that you and I both aren't living in anymore, we can't take responsibility because we never had control. We just can't. Now, I will, but you are right that we do have to be careful about which one of these crackers we let into the community. I don't even like having to call them crackers, but I have to do it to get the point across. Because we know doggone well that we're, we're sitting up here, black folks, having this debate about whether Sean King is in the community or not. But DJ Kid was right off the bat. We're sitting up here having debates on uh, YouTube about whether. A black person, what, what, what a white parent who identifies as black is even still black anymore. If I showed my face, people would debate about whether or not I'm even uh, able to be counted as black, even though both of my parents are black. <laughs> we know this would happen. But let an actual Caucasian play the part and he's accepted into the community. This is hypocrisy. And that, sir, that, Jay Shine, is another reason I can't go back into the U.S. trying to fight this crack on behalf of our people. There's too much hypocrisy. And I, for one, never, ever, ever make a sacrifice for a hypocrite. Black or white. I do not make sacrifices for the Arabs whom I teach because a lot of them are hypocrites. And I'm, I'm not going to make sacrifices for them until they stop their hypocrisy. They're not going to stop it because they're Bedouins. And there's a verse in the Quran that says that the Bedouin... It, it, it says uh, the Arab, but it's spelled in a way that means Bedouin because there are two ways to spell it in Arabic. And it's spelled in a way that means the Bedouin Arab, the desert wanderers, are the severe in disbelief and hypocrisy and are the least likely to know the limits of what Allah revealed to his messenger. The next verse says that um, they, um, they take charity 
to be a punishment. The requirement that they pay charity is, is take, they take it to be a punishment. And then the next verse, um, verse 99 of chapter nine says that there are a few of them that are good as gold and they do what God said for people to do. That's, I mean, it's in their own book and in the other verses, and I've forgotten the numbers of these verses that say the same thing about the better ones. I mean, it warns us that God's word warns us about the better ones. They're hospitable, very much so. That is true. But they're hypocrites. Hypocrisy is a bigger part of their culture than Islam is. You live in a conservative Gulf nation, you'll find it, you'll see it. I had to find, I had to deal with this yesterday. Yesterday, I had to deal with it. I'm teaching students who are in their, they're in their eighth year. They begin their eighth year of English when they come into my environment to learn more English. They're not supposed to come in with AB, well, I got to teach them ABC, one, two, three. They're not supposed to come to me, Jay Shine, with no English at all. That's not the environment in which I was hired to teach. I was hired to take them from a level of some English to a level of more English. That's what I was hired to do. Every single time I can find a job in this area, it's always in the same most backwards Bedouin region of the country. Always. Because that's where they need teachers. Education is weak. They cheat their way through grade school. Then they come to us and they're still used to cheating. We're not from here. We don't let them cheat. It's not normal to us. And they pitch a fit. And you should see how distraught. And even borderline violence some of them will get because you caught them cheating and they're going to have to repeat. They're actually going to fail and going to have to repeat because they weren't supposed to cheat to begin with. They can't take it. They cannot tolerate it. They just can't. That's hypocrisy, bro. They will go to your office. They will interrupt you in another classroom like you don't have another class to teach. They don't give a rat's ass about anything except getting what they did not earn. We all want what we didn't earn. They demand it and expect it. And we'll, we'll just, they'll throw all social convention out the way to do it. You could be at home getting busy with your spouse. They will, if they can, they will walk into your apartment, barge into your bedroom while you're butt naked getting busy with your spouse. I can't believe you did this. Go back and change it. They'll never go tell their people I can't believe you cheat so goddamn much. Go back and change it. We're not supposed to cheat in our religion. Oh, they're not going to say that. We're not the worst in the world. So in all honesty, even if we can't run from this cracker forever, which I do accept as a possibility, we do have to understand that we cannot sit up there and stay where we are over there. I have the, the, the PTSS to prove it. I stayed in the U.S. in a marriage like that for a long time to an Eidos woman, wherein I had no authority that was recognized, but all responsibility put on me. And I had the PTSS to show it. One of the signs of it is an exaggerated startle response to sudden loud noises. I didn't even know I had it until one day when my daughter dropped a bunch of pots and pans. I flinched from the sound of it. And my father looked startled and surprised and scared because he was a physician and he knew the signs of uh, he knew the signs of post-traumatic trauma. A post uh, post traumatic stress. I wasn't even in combat, bro. I got that from a dose. I got that from the same community that you saying we should go back and build. I got that from the same people to whom I was preaching liberation. But I mostly got it from marrying an Ados woman, and she wasn't even the worst that there was to offer. There were many that were a hell of a lot worse than her, but I still got that raw deal. Mostly what got me into that situation was consistently being exposed as a black American man usually is going to be when he's in the U.S. and he's heterosexual. Yeah, consistently being exposed in situations in which you will be held accountable, but you do not have any recognized authority. So you're always at somebody else's mercy. That's what happened. Should we fight? Yeah, but I took my fight somewhere where I had a chance of winning. Because if I'd stayed in the U.S., I eventually would have just, there would have been no way for me to possibly win except to just go on a killing spree, take out some crackers, and go to jail for life or actually get the electric chair. And still, I wouldn't win. <laughs> it, was, it wasn't even a 50-50 chance. I was going to lose. I left, and my life is a hell of a lot better. I'm healthier. That's, what's on, that's what I'm dealing with. Married to a non ados woman for the second time, and happy I did. I'm going to go downstairs from where I'm recording this right now. I'm going to go in. I'm going to say I'm going to give her a hug. 
and I'm going to help her finish cleaning up. When we're done, we're going to sit down and we're going to watch one of our series that we like to watch. She's going to go to a party or a dinner tonight that, one, that a former student is uh, giving in her honor because she's such a good teacher and she's actually helping her students. And they do appreciate, you got the good students who actually do appreciate this sort of thing. Because she's one of the teachers that has actually helped the community here to improve itself. And this is a black woman, non Ados. She has helped to raise the academic standards beyond the school in which she was teaching because she and a few other teachers were here for long enough to do it and they were just that good consistently. And this is going to be done in a little over four hours from now as I'm recording this. I just got through after the Friday prayer, eating lunch with some of my colleagues. We were sitting there talking about teacher strategies. And they were saying, well, you know, Black Heart, you, you might need to soften up on them a little bit. And I said to them, well, I want you to imagine going to a country where um, no matter what you do, you're going to be wrong. Well, that's what America is. Why do you think I would go back to something like that? And they understood exactly what I was what I was getting at. They understood exactly where I was coming from. Some of them were from the United States and some of them were not. And as we talked and as we chatted, they were like, why do we hear that America needs black male teachers? But then you reported such a hard time when you had to teach over there. And I straight told them, America does need black male teachers. They need black male teachers to take the worst classrooms with the worst students so that they can blame these teachers when things go wrong. It's always a setup. Every time it's something good for us, they make sure it's not that good for that long. It's always like that. Man, I see why you left. How do any black men stay in that country? I'm like, they can't leave, bro. That's what's happening. Wow. When they hear about this, they don't understand how America still has any black men. They don't say the same thing for black women. They're saying they don't understand how America keeps its black men. I can't go back and fight for that, bro. What I'm going to do? Slap a bitch when I find out she's sleeping with a white dude? And a corny ass white dude at that? That's what I'm supposed to do? No, I can't do that. Am I supposed to slap the white dude? Can't do that either. Not and get away with it. I mean, I could do it in self-defense, but do it and get away with it? Shoot. If I do it in self-defense, I may not get away with it. America's going back to Jim Crow, bruh. And what was the solution for black folks at that time? Even Malcolm said repatriation, but he was talking about separation. It could be within the continent of, uh, the, of North America. It could be in the Americas or it could be Africa. But even Malcolm at his end said we're going to have to separate from this white man. If you stay in the U.S., they're not going to give up no land. The only land they might give up is Death Valley and Mojave Desert. That's it. Now, you see the reservations that they finally let the Indians have, and those lands are bad. That's why they made them reservations. They may let us share those reservations with the original Americans. They may do that, but separating from that white man is going to have to be done by force. And I don't see a way that we're going to be able to do it without outside help. I just don't see it. Lebanon. It's peaceful now, but they got a diaspora. And the diaspora is influential, actually, in helping um, or they're influential in policy making. It might have to be what we're up to. But at the end of the day, I'm sorry, bro. If, if every Lebanese couldn't stay in Lebanon and that's because they couldn't get along with each other. How all of us going to stay in the U.S. and fight this goddamn white man who's the source of the problems long before we have any problems with each other? I mean, how's that going to work, man? I, I don't know what to tell you, bro. We can't go back, especially, especially if we can be held accountable for stuff like this, letting him in, letting him, you know, being a little too friendly with him. Yeah. Yeah. But even then, that's not for the reason that, that, he, that you mentioned. I mean, we're just not racist like that. Should we have been suspicious of him, kept him at a distance? I would say, yeah, in the South. Yeah, there was a little bit too much of that. We want the acceptance type stuff. That is true. I know because I grew up in a state just like South Carolina. So I know that's an issue. It is. It really is. But the thing is, man, that's just it. I preach liberation. I'm not going to forgive the community. So I might as well not go back anyway, because I'm not going to forgive the community for how they reacted when I was 14 and 15 and 16 talking liberation and the ways that they reacted to it with disdain. 
Not always hatred, not always violence, but dis just the disdain and the ridicule were enough. You can say I'm not doing it because I'm not that disciplined yet, but you don't sit up and act like the one who's right is wrong. And that's where niggas are. That's why I'm still calling us niggas to a certain extent. We act like what's right is right and what's wrong. And we act like what's right is wrong and what's wrong is right. That's a part of our culture. It's just like the better ones here. Difference is, when I tell these better ones, hey, stop interrupting me. <laughs> you know what your religion says. Now, if you ain't going to do it, don't do it. Don't tell me that I'm wrong. They say, oh, you're, you're right. Black heart, you're right. There's a point where they fuck the shuck up. What you think the average U.S. nigga's going to do when I tell them, say, bro, you're selling your people out. That's it. That, end of story. What you think they're going to do? They're going to react with a violence. And I'm not going to forgive them for that because, as you know, black folk ain't always violent with the darkest of us. No, but we get very violent with the palest of us at the drop of a hat. We still divide it, even when we don't hate each other. We still divide it subconsciously on the basis of a lot of things. And a lot of these bases are what white folks consider to be real black and what's not. We're divided on class. We're divided by shade. We're divided by how stereotypical we think that black folks are supposed to be, according to white folks' stereotypes. I can't go back and fix that, bro. You may have a way that you can, but I can't. I don't know how. The only way I know is to tell a patient, this is the diagnosis. And this is the remedy for the diagnosis. This could have prevented it, but this can treat it afterwards. This can mitigate it. This can stop it from progressing. If you will do these things, you can beat it. Are you going to do them or not? I don't know what else to do. When they say, no, nah, I ain't going to do it. <laughs> okay, well, then you're going to stay in the condition you're in. That's it. And that's what it's like dealing with African-Americans. Most of us. The ones that are not ever going to leave the U.S. and wouldn't have the option if they choose to anyway. And that's what it's like dealing with them. I don't know what to tell them. They're just not going to listen. <laughs> they wouldn't listen if I was... Uh, seven feet tall and jet black they definitely ain't gonna listen since I'm under six feet and pale as hell they're just not going to listen they're not the ones I even want to save anymore because them niggas don't listen they interrupt you and they don't know a goddamn thing just like the better ones here difference though when I'm over here and I'm trying this the better ones don't get violent they don't threaten violence and I get paid I get paid enough to look after my kids. I'm not rich, but I get paid enough to do my job as a dad, even from abroad. I go back to the States. I'm never going to get paid. I'm actually going to lose money trying to save niggas. And I'm going to be just like some of these other cats in the movement who are out there trying to save the rest of the community and even got famous doing it, but whose kids got in trouble again and again and again and again. You could look at Michael Manley of Jamaica and, and find that out. Michael Manley, I mean, that man, he really tried to do what's good for the country. He did his best. He wasn't perfect, but he did the best he knew how to do for his country, right? He certainly gave it his best shot. He never tried. He, he tried. You understand what I mean. That's Michael Manley. When Michael Manley was president... He was busy, 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 busy. His kids wanted his attention. To this day, his daughter says, I still suffer from the attention that I could not get from my dad because he was busy. He loved me. He just didn't have much time. That's all. There was no hatred. He wasn't trying to be neglectful of his daughter. If I were to go back to the States, that's exactly what I would be. Oh, there goes Blackheart. He's trying his best. Look what happened to Malcolm's daughters. Malcolm was there... In the community, he passed up a chance to leave. He was offered positions abroad when he traveled. He said it wouldn't, it would solve my problems personally, but it would not help the community. He tried. Has the community behaved in a way that is worth his sacrifice? Hell, knuck, and foe. It's behaved quite the opposite. Well, let's look at what happened with Malcolm's daughters. One of the youngest ones never got over his death. Never did. Well, I'm sure none of them really got over. The, the infants might have, but one of them, I believe her name was Kubel, if I'm not mistaken. She's the mother of Malcolm's grandson who also passed away. She never was quite right. She went uh, to France to study. She hooked up with an Algerian man who probably never got no pussy because it's, it's a conservative, somewhat conservative Arab culture. She hooked up with a Nigerian man, had his baby out of wedlock. That's the grandson of Malcolm X. That grandson was troubled because the mother was troubled. The grandson burned down the place 
accidentally killed his grandmother because he was just trying to start a small fire and get sent back to his mother. He wound up killing his grandmother, the widow of Malcolm. As far as the story goes, De Gregory begs to differ. All right? Now, he went and did this. He went to prison. He was in and out of juvie. He was finally in and out of prison as an adult. Found out about Islam in prison. He didn't find out about it from his mother. He found out about it in prison, like his grandfather had. How did the Islam not survive? Because the American environment is designed that way. So in actuality, we don't need to go back to the States. We, we're going to have to build something elsewhere. Maybe we need to build something elsewhere and in the States. But the Lebanese, when they went abroad, and I don't, I don't even think they're an example for us, but they did one thing that was wise. They went abroad and they built diasporan communities according to how they wanted them to be. That's what they did. Can they go back to Lebanon now? I don't know. They probably can't. But we're going to have to do the same thing because we cannot fix it back in the States. We just can't. We're just not capable. I'm sorry. It's just not possible. Now, that being said, let's also look at Nelson. Nelson could have escaped South Africa. He went back, he got arrested, he went to prison, and there's rumors that his wife cheated on him because he was locked up and she's human. In order for him to get out of prison, he had to make compromises and concessions, and he was tired, I understand that. But that's largely because, frankly, black South Africa just was not going to do like Robert John McBride was going to do and start killing crackers that weren't going to go against their own people. That's what wound up happening. Malcolm actually suspected, if, if what Alex Haley said was true, Malcolm suspected that Betty was cheating on him because of the money problems. Because of the money problems. He was under so much stress, he said that he wasn't able to perform in the bed that much. If what Alex Haley said was true. These are the sacrifices they make. And I'm simply looking at the community as it is, and I'm, I'm saying to myself, God damn it, Ain't no human being worth that much, even you niggas. I've tried. Y'all ain't gonna listen. I'm not, it's not my job to go out there and fight all your battles for you. It ain't no, it's not the job of any one of us, male or female, to go out and fight all the battles for the rest of the community. Especially just so that the community can stay as ratchet as it is and not deal with the consequences. That ain't our job. No, 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 no. So what we gotta do? If I saw a shift in the culture of black America, more towards righteousness and towards Islam. Yes, I'm hegemonistic like that or hegemonic like that, but that's for our benefit. If I saw a shift, I consider going back, but I don't see it. I just don't, bro. I mean, look, man, my daughter was in a southern state in which I was living when she was born. She has since moved up north. Her mother moved up north. She moved with her mother. I said to her, hey, a little bit. So how do you like your new state? She said, oh, I miss the old state. Because the Muslims there don't curse their kids out in the grocery store. I said, wait, are you kidding me? Yup. She meant it, bruh. In one of the oldest African-American communities, not necessarily the oldest, but one of the oldest African-American Muslim communities in the United States. The Muslims are cursing their kids out in the grocery stores in public in front of everybody else. Niqab on, face veils, gloves. Omar, get your little black net out over here and stop looking at that candy. I told you I don't want to hear nothing about no damn candy. I did not tell you that before we came here. Did not, did, did, pow, did not tell you that before we left the house. Don't even look at the candy. Little hard-headed feather mock -up. I ain't got time for that, bro. This the Muslims, man. What am I going to do about the rest of us? Sorry, man. I, I can't help us. The solution's not in the U.S. That's where the problem starts. It's not in Europe either. That's where they problem. That's where they got the program from. And then gave it back to the program. Gave the program back on steroids. That's why Hitler got his stuff from the U.S. Did you know that? Yeah. Hitler got eugenics from uh, American eugenicists. He was shocked when America got into the war against him. Yeah, believe that, bro. I mean, we can't. We just, I can't do it, man. Matter of fact, we, we've heard all the pro-black rhetoric in the United States and them niggas ain't taking it. We need to spread it in Africa if we're going to spread it somewhere. But I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. 
American niggas are something else. We really are different in, in a lot of good ways, but also in a lot of bad ways. And I'm just not, I'm just, I'm not capable. I don't have the ability to go back and do anything to constructive. And it's going to help us out as a whole. A lot of us don't. What I'm doing here makes a difference. It could prevent us from having more enemies later on. That's the that's literally the best I can do because of how devious them damn crackers are and how ignorant and hard headed we are. Just like the better ones. I, I can't. I'm sorry, bro. I can't save us with a thousand others like that. Like us. I couldn't save us because it's 40 million of us. I can't take responsibility for what black women did with this white dude. And I don't know a black man who can. Sorry, man. I wish I did, but if you know a way to fight them, don't put it on YouTube, but tell some people face to face. Maybe put it in an anonymous writing or something, bro. Because I, mean, I can tell you, if we go back to the U.S. and try to build, they're going to resort to violence and they've never failed. It's just the minute we start succeeding, they get jealous. And right now their economy is suffering and they got an opioid crisis. You know they're going to be looking at us hating and ready to kill us off. Because they teeth falling out their mouth from meth and opioids. I mean, they look at us start coming up in the U.S. Start looking. We already look clean when we pull anyway, when we broke. They look up and see us not only looking clean, but actually not being broke anymore while they are. Doing well while they not. They look up and see that, bruh, they're going to kill us. Because they got the numbers. There have been plenty of times the smaller armies have defeated big armies. But they were strategized. They were organized. They listened to input and then the, the leaders listened to the input and then they gave decisions based on the input. They took turns talking. You can't get ignorant ass niggas or crackers in America to take turns talking one at a time without interrupting each other because everybody's a goddamn expert. And now I'm starting to feel that way when I'm listening to black folk. Nigga, you can't tell me nothing because I couldn't tell you nothing. I'm starting to feel that same way. They ain't going to tell me a damn thing. I'm triggered, bro. Sorry, man. We can't take... Now, we... It'd be nice if we could build something to where this wouldn't be possible. I agree that it's it's a, a nice goal. It's a good idea. And it may, may be implementable, but not in the U.S. I'm sorry, man. Just go around and check. Next time you're back stateside, talk about leaving the country and opportunities abroad with brothers, then talk about it with sisters, and you're going to get two different reactions all the time. What about two-thirds of brothers... You're going to not be met with hostility or scoffing at the idea. One third will be all on it. The other third will be neutral. Now watch what the proportion is going to be when you're talking to African-American sisters about opportunities abroad in other countries. Watch what they say, especially when you mention non-European countries. <laughs> Check the laws. You will see that the more you'll see that the less feminist the laws are, the more misandric the laws are. I'm sorry, the less feminine the laws are. Feminist, I'm sorry, the less feminist the laws are, the more sisters will not be willing to give it a shot. You'll find that out very quickly. You'll notice that correlation, even if they're not aware of it. Sorry, bro. White man succeeded over there in America. He won. Niggas let him win. You go back there, start sacrificing, you're going to find out our community ain't worth that much yet. We could become that way if we listen, but we won't. I hope that one day my message is not true in the future. I hope that in the meantime that this is a benefit. Assalamu alaikum.